Please pay attention as I read God's word. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. This is God's word. The Apostle Paul is very clear that salvation is uh, by faith alone, be, through the grace, uh, through Christ alone. So in 1 Timothy he writes, God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. And yet here we read in James that he seems to be saying the opposite, something that seems to be at loggerheads in conflict with Paul. James is saying that you need to have works, that, that faith without works is dead. What gives? Who's right? Is there a conflict? Or, or are, they, um, make, are they making contradictory statements? So some of you may know that this is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Uh, 500 years ago, the Reformation was launched that uh, radically transformed our world, and we are still living in the fruits and the benefits of the Reformation. And, and one of the rallying cries of the Reformation is that salvation is by faith alone, uh, through grace alone, through Christ alone. It's called the, the solas. It's a, a word for alone. Um, and today... This is still one of the major differences where we would have a disagreement with Roman Catholics and where Roman Catholics would be in disagreement with us. So the, the Protestant view is salvation is through faith alone. The, the Roman Catholic view is, is more of a, a, a salvation by faith plus works or faith and, and works. And, and some people would see that, well, James is espousing a, a Roman Catholic view and Paul is um, offering a Protestant view. And, and I want to suggest that, that this contradiction, this conflict, is, is an apparent one. It's a, a seeming one and not actually a real one. And, and so you might be one of our guests here today, and you might be new to Christianity, new to following Jesus. You might uh, not have grown up in a church like me, and so you've just stepped into a church, and you're like, what in the world are they talking about? Something that occurred 500 years ago, and what, what difference does this make to me? And, and it makes a huge difference to all of us. It makes a huge difference because at its core is how you are saved. At its core is the question, and the answer is, how does someone be saved, or become saved, or, or get saved? How is it that Jesus saves someone? And then related to that is the, the issue of faith and works, and, and how do they come together? And you might be somebody who has sort of the common view of, of Christianity, that Christianity is really just about being a, a good person, a moral person, doing good work so that, like every other religion, God will like you or, or bless you or accept you or, or befriend you. But Chris, this, that's not Christianity. Christianity is altogether different. Christianity is not about you. Christianity is for you, but it is not about you. Well, let's look at our, our outline today. Just two simple points. Workless faith cannot save you, and workless faith is dead. Let's, let's look at our first point. Workless faith cannot save you. We're going to jump in at verse 14 where James is asking two questions. And those two questions are meant to uh, elicit a, a certain expected answer. The first question is, what good is it if someone has faith but doesn't have works? And the expected answer is, it's no good. The second question he asks is, can that faith save him? And the expected answer is, no, that faith cannot save him. And, and so to begin to see how 
James and Paul are actually saying very similar things and, and not in conflict is to look at one of the details here in verse 14. If you look at verse 14, you'll see that right after my brothers, James writes, if someone says. And, and so what James is presenting us with a, a, a hypothetical person, a, a situation, a, an imaginary yet very viable situation where someone is saying that they have faith. Someone is saying, claiming that they have faith, but this person who is claiming to have faith in in Jesus has no works, has, has nothing to show for his faith. In other words, he, it's someone who claims to be a Christian, but doesn't show it in his or her actions. Probably somebody that we have all met, and perhaps somebody that many of us have been at one point or another in our lives. And so we see that James's concern here in these verses is not about how someone becomes a Christian. When we think of the conflict between James and Paul and salvation by faith alone, we, we think of how, how it is that someone is saved. And actually, that's not who James is writing to. His concern is not about someone who is saved. His concern is someone who has false faith, or a superficial faith, or a bogus faith. The issue for James is someone claiming to have faith, saying they have faith, but actually they don't. And so here is the difference between Paul and James. Paul addresses the role of faith and works in when someone becomes a Christian. What Paul is saying is, he's, he's dealing with people who are like, how do you become a Christian? And the issue of faith, how does faith play into becoming a Christian, and what role do works play? James is addressing the role in faith of works after someone has become a follower of Jesus. Paul is addressing the issues before someone is a follower of Jesus. James is addressing the issues of faith and works after somebody has trusted in Christ Jesus. See, their target audiences are different. And so the questions that they're trying to answer are different. And so this conflict is superficial at best. See, Paul's enemy is different than James's enemy. Paul's enemy is religion and legalism. James's enemy is an inactive faith. So J. Gresham Machen has written a book, What is Faith? He's the founder of the seminary that I went to. And it's uh, in this statement, and it's, it's a little bit of a longer quote, so please hang with it. But I think it, he summarizes the issue of faith and works, Paul and James, very well. He writes, It was as clear to Paul as it was to James that men who had been saved by faith could not continue to live unholy lives. See, Paul and James are both saying that if you follow Jesus, it is not permission to live an unholy or an ungodly life. Be not deceived, says Paul. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Machen writes, it is difficult to see how anything could be much plainer than that. Paul just as earnestly as James insists upon the ethical and prayer, practical character of Christianity. They both see Christianity as very practical and ethical. Paul as well as James insists upon purity and unselfishness in conduct as an absolute necessary mark of the Christian life. James's issues here today are what are the marks of a true Christian faith, a true Christian life. A Christian, according to Paul, Machen writes, also according to James, is saved not by himself but by God. But he is saved by God not in order that he may continue in sin, but in order that he may conquer sin and attain unto holiness. In other words, we are saved by faith alone, but our salvation produces the byproduct of, of salvation by faith alone, our good works. 
Last week we looked at verse 12 in, in James chapter 2. And, and there James says, So speak and act like someone who lives under the law of liberty. Let me paraphrase for you. So speak and act like someone who is saved. Speak and act in a way that it shows that you have been saved and redeemed by Christ Jesus. And then Paul, uh, James moves directly into our passage today. And he's saying, what good is it, my brothers, if you claim to have faith, but you don't speak and act as if you're saved? You don't speak and act with love. We tend to frame this apparent conflict between faith and works between James and Paul. But notice that James is not drawing a distinction between faith and works. James is just drawing a distinction between faith with works and faith without works. He is drawing a distinction between a true faith and a false faith. A distinction between a living faith and a dead faith. And his concern is very, very pastoral. Because he doesn't want any one of his readers, which includes you and I, to be deceived about the nature of your faith. Because if you're deceived about the nature of your faith, you're also deceived about the nature of your salvation. And he doesn't want anybody to be fooled. And so he continues with his hypothetical yet very uh, realistical person, very realistic person in, in verses 10 and 11. And he gives us this situation that is not at all unreal. He's saying that faith in Christ should produce loving speech and loving acts. There's in Christ. But then he says in verse 10 11, if, if one of you goes to see a, a brother or sister in Christ who is naked, without clothing, who is, who is hungry, and you give them empty words, go and be filled, go and, go and be warm, but do nothing about their condition, you have not done an act of love. And I would argue that you have not spoken in love either. And so he's asking this question, what good is it? This is no good. This faith is no good. Your salvation is no good. Let's come to our, our second bulletin point today. Workless faith is dead. And uh, we're going to look at verse 17. I'm sorry. It's not verses 10, 11, but verses 15 and 16 there. Uh, right now we're on verse 17. So faith by itself is dead. If it does not have works, faith by itself is is dead. A workless faith is dead. And when we continue James's thought uh, next week, we'll see that the works James is talking about are, are faith works, works done in faith. But for us today, how, how can you know? How can you spot? How, how can you discern whether you have a true faith or a false faith? How, how can you know whether you're someone claiming to have faith but, but doesn't have faith? How can you know that you, whether your faith is alive or dead? So uh, some of you know that I'm a, a police chaplain and um, we have other um, emergency and, and medical and first responder type people here at Grace. And um, so picture a, a scene where you've come across a body and it's, it's not moving. And, and the first thing you do to determine after you check the scene and make sure that it's safe to approach the body is to determine what the vital signs are. Is this person alive or dead? And, and so you might put your hand um, near their mouth to feel if they're breathing. You might check their pulse. Uh, you might see if the body is warm or cold. You might look at their chest to see if it's rising with breath. You might look at their eyes to see if there's any, any movement there. But you find out that there's no breath, that the body in fact is pretty darn cold, that there, there's no movement, there's no uh, chest rising, there's no eye movement, no pulse, nothing. And so the person is dead. It's a dead body. What James is doing is he is offering you and I a way to take vital signs of our faith. 
to, to measure whether our faith is alive or dead. And the vital signs are works. And James specifies what those vital signs are. They are acts of love and, and words spoken in love. Back to James verse 12. Speak and act as if you are one who is saved. One who has been redeemed. And so today is an opportunity for you to take the vital signs of your own faith. Are there signs of the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Do they appear in your life? So, you might be like me. And, and the fruit of the Spirit shows up in my life in, in strange kind of ways. So, by nature, I'm, I'm pretty much a jerk. You, you can ask my wife, you can ask my, my family, anybody who knows me. I'm pretty much a jerk. And, and the way that the Holy Spirit shows up in my life is that uh, there are days when I am less of a jerk which is a sign that I've become just a little bit more gentle and just a little bit more kind, just a, a little bit more good. And I, and I chuckle when it's a sign that uh, the Spirit's working in my life, and I chuckle when people are like, man, your pastor is a jerk of a Christian. And, and I chuckle, it's because like, man, you should have met me before I was a Christian. The word you would not be using is not jerk. It's a word that would be a little inappropriate for children. Although now that I think about it, most of our children have left for Covenant Kids, so I could probably go ahead and say it. You are probably like most people, and you think that you're not really spiritually dead. That your starting point is that you're maybe on life support, and then, and then the Spirit comes to you and kind of resuscitates you. But Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2 that our spiritual state is a dead one. You are dead in your sins and your trespasses. That your vital signs are not existent. That the body is cold. It is not breathing. There are no brain waves. There is no eye movement. There is no pulse spiritually speaking. And the picture of a dead person is very helpful because once a person is completely dead, I'm not talking about where they can be resuscitated with the paddles or something like that, but actually dead, there is no bringing them back to life apart from God. And here's what we tend to do, spiritually speaking, once again. We tend to take our, our dead souls and we, we treat it like a dead body and, and we want to show that it's alive. So what do we do? We, we take our dead body and we put a heater next to it to raise the body temperature to 98.6 degrees. We, we get a, a little pump that might move our, our lungs so that it, there's breath. We, we might do something, uh, some sort of compression so that our blood pumps like the heart rate and so that you could actually check and find that yes, the person, has their body is warm, it's 98.6 degrees, that they are breathing, that they have a pulse. Would you say that that person is alive or dead even though the vital signs, you would think that they're alive? Absolutely not. And that's what we try and do with works. We try and take a dead soul and add good works to them to demonstrate that it's alive, but adding good works to a dead soul will never make a dead soul alive. And that's why we need the radical heart surgery of the Holy Spirit. When we in faith trust in the life, death, and resurrection of the Son of God who has come to save sinners and to begin to follow Him, that He will one day, as He's been resurrected, we will also be resurrected. And it's that spirit that he gives us that creates a new heart in our lives. A heart that starts beating. Lungs that start breathing. A pulse and a body that is warm and alive. It is ridiculous to create vital signs from the outside. Vital signs never make someone alive. Rather, 
they demonstrate that someone is already alive. And that's what James is saying here with works. Works will never produce salvation. In fact, your good works will even get in the way of your salvation because you will begin to trust in them instead of the grace of Jesus' Son. And we get this order confused. And this is one of the, the, the glorious moments of the Reformation and what the Reformation did for the church. It put this relationship that got out of order between faith and works, it, it puts it back in order. It puts it, uh, faith and works on, on the right understanding. James is concerned for his readers' souls. He's concerned for someone who is claiming, says that they are a Christian, but has no works, has no vital signs. He's saying that if you don't have vital signs, your faith is dead. But the way to become alive is, is, is not to add more good works, but it's to lean into the gospel with more faith, to trust in Jesus, to repent and turn from your sins and embrace the grace that is freely offered in Christ Jesus. And this is a great evaluation, heart evaluation for us today. Does, do your vital signs demonstrate loving speech and loving action. Paul said it perfectly in Galatians 5 6. What counts is faith expressing itself through love. It is what, what matters, what is good, is faith being embodied, faith being worked out, faith expressing itself through love. So every week we work our way in our liturgy through a, a New City Catechism question and the timing couldn't have been more brilliant than to have a question number 30 that talked about salvation by faith alone uh, in today's uh, liturgy. In four weeks we'll do question 34. And, and we can work our way through these questions and it's good to begin to familiarize yourself with them, even memorize them. But take some time to consider them because they can be very, very powerful. And question 34 asks this question. Since we are redeemed by grace alone, through Christ alone, must we still do good works and obey God's word? So what the question is asking is since we're saved through faith and grace alone, must we still do good works? And the answer is yes. Because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, also renews us by his spirit. So that you may show love and gratitude towards God. So that you may be assured of your faith by the fruits. So that by your godly behavior you may win some, others may be won to Christ. And what is this question and answer saying? It's saying that you are saved for a purpose. You are saved with a reason, that you are saved, so to speak, with a mission. And that mission, that purpose, comes out in this question with three, did you hear those, so that's, the, the three reasons. And I think there are three helpful takeaways for us today. Number one, through your good works, you will show love and gratitude to God. Through your good works, you will show love and gratitude to God. So uh, my wife and I financially support uh, Young Life Chesapeake uh, here. And, and every now and then, um, I mean, with our monthly payment, we get some form letter from like Colorado or, or something like that, which is nice and, and sweet. But, but what's really terrific is uh, Steve has like this sweatshop of teenagers in a conics box out behind the Young Life office where it's like you can't go on their summer camp trip until you fill out a thousand thank you notes. It was about three or four times a year I get a thank you note from some teenager whom I've never met thanking uh, me for my wife and I's support of Young Life. And, and, and the vision in my mind is because they've got so many supporters is Steve is just cranking out. He's got like them handcuffed to the chair and they, they can't go on the retreat until they, they do all of these. Yeah, amen. There you go. <clears throat> thank you. 
But, but these students are, I think, it's, it's tremendously sweet. And, and, and I get a big kick out of it uh, because they're just showing gratitude. They're, they're showing thanksgiving to somebody who, who they've never even met. Have you ever considered that your good works are like a thank you note of love and gratitude for salvation to God? Have you ever considered that your good loving speech and good loving acts when they're motivated by faith is, is like a handwritten thank you note to, our, to your Heavenly Father? Today I want to suggest that it is, that your good works are the ways in which you show gratitude and, and love to God for redeeming you. Number two, through your good works, you may be assured of your salvation. Through your good works, you may be assured of your salvation. I don't care if you've been walking with Jesus for 40 years or four days. You will wonder at some point whether you indeed are saved. You will wrestle, you will have dark moments, dark nights of the soul. You will wonder and, and question whether God has called you to follow Him, whether He has brought you into new life, into a, a saving faith. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, who had done a great labor of love and shown a patient endurance of hope and faith. And he commends them for it. And he says that your, your patient and faithful hope and, and your labor of loves is a sign that you may be encouraged and assured that God has really redeemed you and he is at work in your life. See, the presence of the fruit of the Spirit is a sign, it is an assurance that God has called you to be His child. That what God has begun, He will finish and He will complete. That when God has called you to salvation, He will see you through to the end. That you may have great confidence and hope that you are a child of God. And so I have a homework assignment for everyone. You might be like me where I'm the last person to see how God is working in my life. Like, my sins just wreck me all the time. They like, it's like I feel like I sin in technicolor, and, and they're always there, and they're, they're always condemning me, and, and they're always, uh, you know, and that's where I, I have to go back to the gospel, but my mistakes and failures seem to loom large. And it's often other people who see God's work in my life be long before I do. And, and so here's your homework assignment. Find somebody. Could be somebody close to you. Uh, doesn't have to be somebody that close to you. And go tell them how you have seen God working in their lives. Go tell them how you've seen the fruit of the Spirit growing and building in their, in their lives. How you've seen love increased in their lives. And what you'll do is you will encourage them and provide them great courage and assurance of salvation. Let us help one another be assured of our salvation. Because I'll tell you what, when you come to those times of wondering and questioning, and you'll be able to look back and see God's work in your life, and it confirmed by somebody else that you weren't imagining it, it'll be a powerful, powerful means to continue to follow Jesus day in and day out. And number three, through your good works, your neighbor may also be one to Christ. Through your good works, your neighbor may also be one to Christ. I have yet to argue anybody into the kingdom of heaven. Yes, truth is very important. I'm not one of these guys who's going to say, okay, you know, preach the gospel, but use, use words if necessary. I mean... That, that's like a whole, whole other tangent. But the gospel fundamentally are words, so we need to communicate the words of the gospel. But the best barrier, the, the best way to break down the barriers to faith and, and help somebody move from unbelief to belief is through loving acts 
good works. Nothing breaks down barriers to God than good works. Somebody who's disenchanted and has been burned or felt like they've been burned by God, how about hospitality, a loving relationship, a listening ear, a compassionate heart? That will wear down somebody's hard heart like nothing else. Nothing else breaks down the arguments against God's existence than acts done in love, acts done for the unlovely, love shown to the materially poor, those down and out, those who, who need justice and mercy. And it may be the loving act of us serving in cast this fall, where we, we care for homeless people in our community. It may be volunteering to teach or just be part of the class and befriending lonely uh, college students or, or spending time over pizza befriending a, a, a TCC student through Life Explored. It may be entering a neighbor's life with patience and kindness and hospitality, inviting them over and being with them and listening to their story like nobody has ever listened and, and allowing them to peer into your life giving them the warmth of the gospel of grace. These things will win your family members, your roommates, your teammates, your classmates, your, your, the people your work, you, you work with to Christ like nothing else can. Let me pray for us.